Hey everybody, Mr. J here, and today, oh, oh, good thing I had this tissue here, otherwise that would have been disgusting, it would have gotten all over the camera. Oh, what a good segue. Today we are going to be talking about tissues, and no, I don't mean the tissue I just sneezed into. We're going to be talking about the clusters of cells in your body. So tissues, just generally speaking, are just a bunch of cells together that are doing some sort of similar function. And there's four main types we're going to go through today in detail, so you can understand Oh, excuse me. You can understand them going forward. So here are our learning objectives. I'll let you look over them real quick. I'll give you the main ones. We're going to really talk about those four tissue types and talk about the functions, you know, structure if it's function, right? I'm going to go into detail about epithelial tissue. I'm going to skip over glands a bit. And then we'll talk about connective tissue. We'll talk about the uh, muscle tissue. And then we'll finally talk about the nervous tissue. So those are the four main tissue types. But before we do that, I just want to give you a quick overview of where we're working at. So we began all of these lessons at the atomic and molecular level, right? We were talking about just specific atoms binding together, doing different things. We got to macromolecules like your carbohydrates, your lipids, proteins, nucleic acids. Then I talked about the cells and their organelles, so some of the functions of them. Well, now I'm talking about all of these cells combining together into tissues. And as you can see, the next step up will be the organ, okay? Because then we'll start talking about organs and their organ systems. And all of these things, these guys, are made of tissues, okay? So organs are just a collection of tissues. And today we're gonna to talk about the tissue types themselves. So first off, here are the four types, okay? I already said basically everything that's on here. So we're gonna go through epithelial, connective, muscular, and nervous. So let's start off with just some of the general functions of each. You can kind of think based on the name of what they do. So think epithelial. Epi, okay, means on top of. And philia means sheet. So it means like a lining or a sheet-like layer on top of something. Okay, most of the linings of your body, so your gastrointestinal tract, your respiratory tract, your skin, are all made of this epithelial tissue, as well as your blood vessels and other things like that. So they're coverings and linings, as well as some glands we'll talk about too. Connective tissue, you can think they're connecting things, right? They're binding things, supporting, protecting. They're doing a whole lot of stuff. I like to think of the connective tissue section as just the yes section because it's got a lot of different things. Okay, so we'll talk about connective in detail. Muscle is easy, starts with M. It's for movement. Okay, we're going to talk about the three types of muscle tissue in your body. You may not know one, I bet you know two of them. And then lastly, we'll talk about the nervous tissue, all the stuff that makes you anxious and uh, okay, just kidding. No, the nervous tissue is actually the neurons. So those cells that are sending signals through your brain and your spinal cord to tell your body what to do in certain situations. Um, and so these are all primarily to communicate with your body tissues. Okay, so let's start with the epithelial tissues. So epithelial, once again, means a sheet that's on top of something. There are a ton of different areas that have epithelial tissue. Now, two things I want to point out. One, they will have an apical surface. So if you think of like an apex, usually it means like the top of something. So there's an apical surface, okay, and exposed to the outside environment. Okay, so for example, the apical surface of your skin, your epithelial tissue would be at this top part that's exposed to the air. In your gastrointestinal tract, you've got basically a hole. The hole inside is actually the basement membrane, and on the outside of that, the top part of those cells would be the apical side of the cells. It's actually facing the blood vessels that's going to absorb the food. This will make more sense as we go along. I mentioned also there's a basement membrane. So for example, on the base of my skin layer, so underneath my skin, there's going to be a bottom section of basement membrane. Okay, so I'm going to show you what that looks like here in a second. And then secondly, we categorize epithelial tissue based on shape and based on layer. So shape and layer. So let me give you an example. <clears throat> this is simple squamous epithelial tissue. Okay, so let's point out some things. First off, it's simple. That means that there is one layer of cells. There's one cell, one cell, one cell. Okay, we can contrast that with stratified. So strata means layer. Okay, so stratified squamous. So stratified means there's multiple layers and squamous means squashed or flattened. So these are a lot of flattened squamous cells, but this one is stratified because it's got many layers. 
Okay, and then we've got our basal surface, so the basement membrane that we mentioned here right beforehand. And then we have the apical surface, so which would be on the top side. Okay, so this is kind of how you need to think of epithelial tissue. There's a bottom and then there's a top part. And depending on where the cells are at, they're going to do different things, whether they're uh, near the basement or near the apical surface. surface excuse me. Okay, so let's talk about each one. Simple squamous just went through. They're super thin. So think about things that are really, really thin, okay? In biology, we're going to see that a lot of things like to pass through this simple squamous epithelium really is easily. So for example, here's an example of simple squamous epithelial tissue. So here's, if you look underneath a microscope, this is what your alveoli in your lungs look like. This is a very, very thin cell that just allows gases like oxygen and carbon dioxide to pass through back and forth really easily. Okay, it makes sense because it's a super thin cell, so it wants to just let things pass through really easily. If the cell was bigger, it would be harder to think, have things pass through quickly. Okay, so this is simple squamous. An example would be in your alveoli, in your capillaries, other things like that. Then we've got simple cuboidal. Okay, so simple, remember, is one layer. Cuboidal literally tells you that it looks like a cube, right? And these guys, think about it. The last one was simple squamous, flattened. There's not really much space inside the cell to do much. It's just basically there to have a lining and then let things pass in and out. But cuboidal, these have got some meat to it, right? There's some stuff inside the cells. So these cells are usually things that like to produce secretions. So like fluids that like that. Uh, so sweat glands, um, uh, apocrine glands, so like your sebaceous glands that make oil. These are all usually cuboidal epithelial tissue. They've got space basically to secrete some things. And in this case, it's showing that it's also in the kidneys. So the kidneys do two things. They reabsorb as well as secrete things. So they basically go back and forth between the two. So they're still relatively small cells, but they have enough room to make secretions within themselves uh, to, you know, do whatever functions they are doing. So that's an example of the kidney. Awesome. And here, let's let's actually point this out. I mentioned the basement membrane, right? This is this layer on the bottom of the cells. And then this is the apical surface right here. And as you can notice, it points into what's called a lumen, so an empty space. So remember how I said the apical surface is kind of going towards an open environment? This is a great example of it. You take a cross section, you see which part is facing that open hole, basically. And that's the apical surface. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now we're talking simple columnar, okay? Simple, one layer, columnar, column, right? Now these are located in several different areas, including your stomach, your intestines, and those types of things. And the reason these are the way they are um, is because with columnar cells, they need to do a couple things. One, they need to have space inside the cell for secretion. So let me give you the example of your intestines. In your intestines, you've got these cells <clears throat> that are basically producing mucus, a lot of mucus to protect the lining of your intestines. So they've got to have some room to do that. However, they also need to absorb nutrients. So as you can see with these guys, they've got all these little projections called microvilli on their uh, apical surface. So remember the surface that's opening to the lumen, the hole of your gut. And this increases the surface area so that they can bring a lot of molecules in. So like nutrients, oxygen, sugars, uh, proteins, and then bring them to the basement membrane and then put them into the bloodstream. Okay, so they're going to be actively pulling things in, pushing them down into these will actually be a connective tissue and some blood supply, put it into the blood supply. So then you can distribute it throughout the body. So that's what's happening in your gastrointestinal tract, primarily in your small intestine. Okay, so that's simple columnar. Last one for um, <clears throat> the simple ones is pseudo stratified columnar epithelium. Pseudo refers to false. Stratified means layer. So it almost has a false layer. The key to noticing what pseudostratified columnar epithelium tissue are is they have these little cilia on their surface. So look at these guys. Notice in the pseudostratified these long, long, long things of cilia. And these are not the microvilli. These are just little projections that help uh, increase surface area for absorption. These cilia are a lot longer. And these guys, I want you to think of like a seaweed, okay? They kind of move with a current, 
okay? What these cilia do, especially in your respiratory tract, is if any mucus gets into your lungs, you don't want them to get all the way down into your alveoli and where a gas exchange is actually happening because that will really cause infections and other issues. So you have all these cilia lining it that literally beat all of the mucus, the bacteria and crud back up to about here, which is where you <clears throat> cough it out or you can swallow it. And then it goes down to your stomach and gets destroyed. So it's kind of a protective agent for your body. Um, and again, the reason it's epithelial tissue is it's lining the inside of that tract. Okay, perfect. Now, stratified. There's now stratified examples of the squamous, the cuboidal, and the columnar. So here's some stratified squamous. This is in your skin. Uh, this is also in your esophagus um, to basically uh, just basically protect all the food that's going down into your stomach. Um, but the key here is there's a lot of flat layers, okay? And usually what happens is that the basement membrane, these cells are actively dividing and will be pushed up, pushed up, pushed up until they will slough off. So think about your skin, right? You slough off millions of cells every day because your skin is basically dividing, 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 getting to the top of the skin, and then they slough off, okay? So this is a really good protective agent in your skin as well as in your esophagus. Stratified cuboidal. Again, cuboidal means that they've got more space, okay, to make some things. These are still common in your glands, so things that are making secretions, specifically your salivary glands, okay? So salivary glands, they've got a couple layers, they're stratified, but they're also cuboidal cells that are producing some sort of secretion, okay? So an example would be your salivary glands. Then lastly, your stratified columnar epithelial tissue. This means that multiple layers of columnar epithelial. This is really uncommon. In fact, I think the only place that you find this in your body is in that uh, urinary tract in the urethra. Um, so I would just assume that the reason it's uh, stratified and columnar is just to protect a little more. I mean, you've got some toxins and waste that's going out the urethra, so you want to protect everything else that's inside of it. So the lining is a little more thick with columnar epithelial tissue. And I said last the last time, but this is actually the last one. Transitional. This one's also very uncommon, but it's kind of cool. It's found in your ureters and your bladder. So your, your ureters are the ones that are connected to the kidneys that bring urine down to the bladder to be excreted from the body eventually. So what this needs to be able to do is kind of contract and then relax and contract and relax, contract and relax. So if you look at it, we've kind of got uh, cuboidal looking cells and maybe some more columnar looking cells, but they can do, they can basically contract and stretch and flatten. So it's just like uh, if you've ever seen like, I don't know, a hoodie, you can kind of press it down and then it'll kind of come back up and then press it down and then come back up a little bit. That's similar to transitional epithelium. And that's important, especially in the bladder, because you need to contract the bladder every once in a while, and then you need to basically relax it again. So this is the lining of the bladder that helps it kind of stretch, relax, stretch, relax, stretch, relax. Here's a great chart if you want to memorize it. Hopefully you're memorizing more based upon structure and function. So think like, okay, simple squam is super flat. It's lining, but it's going to let things pass through easily. Big stratified columnar epithelium. It's long. It's got those cilia. So it's going to move things up in the respiratory tract and those types of things. So try to think of it based more on what the structure is and then try to determine the function from there. I mentioned glands, so these are epithelial tissue, usually cuboidal or columnar, as we mentioned before. Um, and you can divide these out into two ways. This is just something good to know for the future. If you ever hear exocrine gland, it means that the glands, so the secretions of that cell are going to eventually go out of the body. So think about like salivary glands. They secrete into your mouth where you could either spit or swallow. Either way, it's gonna go out, right? It's gonna go out of the body eventually. Now, endocrine glands, this is going to deal with hormones. Endocrine literally means internal secretion. So we're secreting things into the bloodstream. Okay, so they're two completely different things. There are three different types of glands. I really don't talk about this in my lectures. Uh, there's miracrine, apocrine, and holocrine. You can look at what they do. Uh, so the most common are miracrine. Uh, they produce like watery fluids, like sweat glands, salivary glands, those types of things. Apocrine glands, they're most common in mammary glands, so basically the milk glands, especially for females. And this is when instead of just kind of uh, secreting their fluid into a space, these actually pinch off a portion of the cell. So like if this is the cell, it'll basically pinch off a little portion of itself and push it out. And then that kind of will pop and burst. 
and allow things to get out. Uh, it's trying. It's kind of like budding. If you've ever seen like a tree budding off from itself, it goes like this, and then it buds off, and then that kind of pinches off and goes and does something else. That's similar to apocrine glands. And then holocrine is when cells actually completely divide, and one goes off and literally just blows up and releases all of its stuff. These are common in your sebaceous glands. Remember acne when you're in like middle school and it was terrible. It's because those sebaceous glands were dividing like crazy, bursting all these cells, and sometimes they get infected and look gross. So this is what that would actually look like. So here, remember with the miracrine glands, they're just secreting stuff into the space. It goes out of the body. Apocrine glands, little bits and pieces of the cells are pinching off, and then they go out. And then in the holocrine glands, the cell actually divides, breaks apart, and then bursts, okay? The reason this could be an issue when you're in middle school is because all these cells are bursting inside and sometimes you can get infections in here. So white blood cells will come in and it'll just get all swollen and uh, gross, uh, which just describes middle school in general. So anyway, those are the exocrine glands. Now let's get into connective tissues. Hopefully I can continue going pretty quick. Uh, this is just supposed to be a really good overview of all the different types. So connective tissue does a whole lot of stuff. But one thing I want you to keep in mind is that the connective tissues, let me write this down. I want you to write this down as well. Connective tissues are made of cells, whoops, cells, gels, and fibers. Cells, gels, and fibers. So when you look at connective tissue, you will see the cells. You will often see them floating around in this like sort of matrix gel-like structure, and then there will be a bunch of fibers around it. OK, so the way we actually describe connective tissue is based on do they have all three of these uh, things, cells, gels and fibers, otherwise known as ground substance, fibers, extracellular matrix and cells. Um, so cells, gels, fibers. Now let's move on. This is what it would look like. So if you have the cells in here, so you've got all the cell membranes, you got some stuff inside the cells. And then this is kind of the fluid outside of it. So the gels and then you've got all these fibers. OK, so the cell, the gel gel here and then the fibers here okay i'm going to skip the cell types fibroblasts just means like building fibers macrophages are going to be going different places mast cell we be going different places it's similar to uh, white blood cells um but they're different in that some stay where they're at uh, it's like bone cells like to stay where they're at whereas wandering they can move and go different places like white blood cells uh so those are some cool pictures of them they're really pretty actually Okay, uh, so with connective tissue, you also see three different types of fibers. The collagen ones will be really thick and strong. They're very common in very thick and strong structures like your tendons and your ligaments. The elastic fibers will be more common in things that need to stretch out and move. So like your vocal cords that if you've ever seen your vocal cords, they stretch and relax and that's how they vibrate and make noise. And then the reticular fibers are a little more thin. They're not as strong, but they give some sort of beefy support uh, common in your spleen. Um, so uh, the two different types you can talk about when you're talking about connective tissue, there's all these subdivisions. The way I like to subdivide them is based on the proper connective tissue, which is what you think of when you think of connective tissue. And it's either going to be loose, so not very many fibers, or dense, a lot of fibers. Or it can be specialized, where it really doesn't look like the general connective tissue, but it also connects things. So things like cartilage, bone, interestingly, and blood. OK, so now I'm just going to show you pictures. And I think this will help you understand it better. So areolar kind of sounds airy, right? This is a type of loose connective tissue. Why? Because you can see there's a lot of space in between the cells and the fibers. OK, so there's all these fibers going around. There's cells like fibroblasts chilling and then there's ground substance. So basically the fluid inside of it. These are found in the connections between your muscle cells. So they need to be able to stretch and also keep things together. So kind of a good balance between strong yet stretchy. OK, that's areolar or connective tissue. Adipose tissue, interestingly enough, is fat tissue. And this is a connective tissue type because, again, it like pads underneath the skin, pads your organs, so it connects them well. And as you, as you can see here, you've got these cells and then you've got all of this fat droplet, right? Um, so this is a type of adipose tissue and it's really, really obvious because it's just chock full of fat. Um, and the cells are basically just maintaining that fat content as they go. 
So those are two types of loose connective tissue. Now we're going to talk about dense connective tissue. And if you think about it, you think of strong uh, parts of your body. Okay, so for example, in your tendons or ligaments, you've got these really, really dense, thick fibers that you can really only see very thin cells. And then the rest of it's a strong collagen uh, fiber network, right? So these are all your collagen fibers are super strong and white looking. Okay, and so they are very strong and connect things well. Um, one thing with collagen fibers is they don't get much blood supply. So they're white because they lack a blood supply. So these take a long time to heal. If you've ever like ruptured or torn or partially torn a tendon or a ligament, it takes a long time to heal it because the blood and all the nutrients to heal it don't get there very often. So that's a fun fact about those. Cartilage usually is between bones, but sometimes it can also be kind of free floating. So let me give you some examples. Hyaline is the most common. So think your uh, rib cage. Okay, so bones connected to bones. You've got cartilage in between. It's very, very strong, but it can also bend just a little bit, not too much because obviously it'll snap. Um, and here you'll see the chondrocyte, so the cell, it literally means the cartilage cell. You've got the matrix out here that is made of like a really tough gel, uh, fibrous, uh, not, not too fibrous actually, it's just like a really strong gel, kind of like a, you know how if you have pottery, like clay, and it's really soft and then you put it in a kiln and it make, makes it really hard. It's similar to here, they secrete this sort of fluid, but then it gets really hard so that it can be very supportive. So that's common in your rib cage. Elastic cartilage is the weird one. Uh, I don't know why it's called cartilage. It almost just looks like kind of loose connective, um, but it's only in your ear as well as in your epiglottis in the back of your uh, throat covering your trachea. Um, and these are really hard to differentiate because you'll see those chondrocytes again, those cartilage cells, but then you've got some fibers here. So you can know that it's a little, you know, bendy and elastic like your ears, which mine are like Dumbo. Uh, so they're very elastic and very large. Um, so that's elastic cartilage. And then fibrocartilage. This is the happy medium between hyaline and the um, <clears throat> and the elastic cartilage. These are found between your uh, vertebrae and your intervertebral discs. So between your vertebrae and the discs, they're like little padding, similar to your meniscus, right? So this provides a lot of padding and support, but it's not too hard, right? Because with bones and bones, you want to have like a cushion, like a nice, hard, firm, but yet kind of cushiony cushion between them so that if you jump and your vertebrae basically stack on top of each other, you want them to be able to kind of move a little bit. So fiber cartilage is pretty obvious to see. You've got those clear chondrocytes, but then you've got these nice, strong, thick fibers that are collagen in between them. Okay. And then there's bone. Bone is different. We'll talk about that a little more in the skeletal system. Um, but the matrix of the bone is really hard, obviously. Um, and the cells of the bones can do several different things. They can either maintain the bone, they can break it down, they can build it up. So we'll talk a little more about bones in the skeletal system. And then finally, blood. Blood, the function of blood, as you can think, it needs to transport stuff throughout the body. The reason you have blood is to basically feed your cells. Okay, well, why is this a connective tissue? Well, you've got cells, right? You've got gels, so like the plasma, the fluid that's surrounding your blood cells. And then you'll also have fibers that'll be floating around. So like platelets, and uh, I guess platelets are more like cell types, um, but you'll have different proteins that are floating through. So it's considered a connective tissue. Um, so that's basically the summary of all the connective tissue. As you can tell, there's a ton of it, right? So it doesn't help to really memorize. I would really think, okay, what does it look like? What do you think it does? Like, uh, dense connective tissue. Why would it need to be dense and strong? Oh, to connect like tendons, right? So muscle to bone or ligaments, bone to bone, those types of things. It needs to be really strong, right? So just think structure versus function as always. Uh, I'm going to skip membrane types. Um, there's different types of membranes we kind of talked about in chapter one, uh, but I'm going to skip over that and keep going into muscle tissues and nervous tissues. So first off, muscle cells. Muscle cells exist to move things. Okay, so anything in your body that moves, whether you blink, whether you're moving your hands, whether your stomach's churning, all muscle. Okay, all muscle cells. There's three different types. There's skeletal, which as you can guess, connects to your skeleton, right? So your bones that you think of when you think of bones, right? So hand muscles, biceps, triceps, uh, deltoids, all those things. Smooth muscle 
is actually going to be things that you can't control. It's involuntary. Things like your intestinal walls, things like your arterioles, so the arteries that can kind of constrict or dilate. Um, and then you've got your cardiac, which you also can't control, like with like actively thinking about it, but it's also just beating constantly and it's your heart tissue as cardia tells you. Okay, so skeletal muscle looks like this. You can control this, it's voluntary. And as you can see, you've got these really thin nuclei and really striated, striated protein fibers that are connecting both sides. And these guys will actually contract and relax based on if you're contracting or relaxing your muscle. We'll talk about in the muscular system. Again, with smooth muscle tissue, it's really smooth looking, right? Um, so smooth muscle tissue lines your intestinal walls and it helps kind of contract and relax, contract, relax. Okay, that's called peristalsis, if you've heard of that before. Um, and this is involuntary, um, and they contract a little differently. We'll talk about it more in the muscular system. Then cardiac muscle tissue. This one looks similar to skeletal muscle because they've got those striations. So these are striated muscles because they've got those lines, and they contract the same way. So they're going to shorten, basically, in order to contract, relax, contract, relax in the heart tissue. And we'll talk about that more in the cardiovascular system. Finally, we're almost there. You're doing great. Nervous tissue. Okay, nervous tissue is found in the brain, spinal cord, and the nerves that connect them. Okay, and this all exists to basically tell your body what to do when, as well as to receive information and integrate it within your central nervous system. So the first thing you need to know is that they're made of neurons. These are the functional unit of the nervous system, and they've got a big cell body, so like the main part of the cell, but then they've got all these extensions from them. The axon is the part that's actually going to send the signal. And then the dendrites are the ones receiving the signal. So if you think about like your eyes, right, you're going to receive light information with the dendrite aspect. To tell your brain about what you're seeing, you're going to send a, um, it's called an action potential, but a signal down your axon to talk to the brain about it. Okay, so that's functionally how the neurons work. Now, if you look here, you see a bunch of dots around it. These are not neurons. These are called glia. So glial cells literally means nervous tissue or nerve glue tissue, okay? It means nerve glue tissue. I said that wrong. So it's the glue that connects all the neurons. And these guys are going to support and nourish and help those neurons function properly. I think we'll talk about them more in the nervous system. There's things like microglia that like fight off infections and there's astrocytes that like cover the neurons. So there's gonna be a lot of things to learn with the neuroglia later on. All right, I think we did it. So remember, big summary, there's epithelial, connective, muscular, and nervous tissue. We will see it, as I've said many times, we'll see it come up again and again in different systems. So I'll be sure to point it out as I lecture. Um, but for now, just know generally the different structures and therefore the different functions of all of these tissue types. I appreciate you watching. I hope this was a really good, helpful overview. Um, and please comment if you have any questions on the YouTube channel, or you can shoot me an email. And I appreciate your, your work, and I appreciate your learning. So you all have a great day.